This is Dr. Charles Parker, and you're listening to Core Brain Journal. It's a place where I connect both fresh discoveries and interesting different perspectives from advanced mind science with the realities of real people and everyday life down on Main Street. Well, welcome board folks. Dr. Charles Parker here one more time. And we have a very interesting guest. I'm going to tell you right off the bat what Tim Pahoot is going to be talking to us about. He's going to be talking to us about not mind mapping, friends, but life mapping. Now, some of you have been around and you remember Dr. Edward DeBono, one of my mentors, or you've seen if you look on the mission page. And Tony Buzan was a guy that was doing long, long time ago mind mapping. We have an expert here. Tim is going to be telling us about life mapping. Tim, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Chuck, thank you so much for having me. I, I really appreciate you having me on the show, and I appreciate what you guys, what you're doing there. I love it. I love it. You're it's doing great it. fun. It's going to be fun talking to you. I'm going to learn from you this afternoon. It's going to be so much fun. It's going to be a oh, battle yeah, to, to figure out who I'm can. I'm going to say a couple more. words from our sponsor, and then I'm going to come back and introduce you. Please do. So then, Core Brain Journal is sponsored by Great Plains Laboratory. They are deep international biomedical testing leaders for improved targeted mind science details. Who doesn't really like details? As both laboratory and their webinar global thought leaders, they provide the most comprehensive set of hard data measurement tools for real biomedical answers beyond what's the traditional status, guesswork, guesswork, guesswork. They also provide multiple training webinars. This is really important for both the public and medical providers on how to use the data that they provide effectively in the office, in your life. Check out their website for references and testing details. I think they're the thought leaders on this whole biomedical testing process. There are other companies that do, laboratories that do it. They have so much deep training, it's unbelievable. Take note of this. You can now register as a guest here, as a listener here at Core Brain Journal, for a complimentary test drawing. This week, the test drawing is for... GPL tox profile for toxins that you take in your body that can get your brain completely out of whack. I mean, everything and the toxins are phenomenally interesting. And I'm not going to take your time right now, but go to cbj.com forward slash 125. Dr. Shaw, the director of Great Plains Laboratory, talks all about the GPL tox profile. So you can get that uh, free test drawing. You can get a complimentary test and enter the drawing, if I can say it, at greatplainslaboratory.com forward slash CBJ for Core Brain Journal. Why not give it a shot? So let me tell you about Tim Bahuda. Tim is a traveling happiness coach from White House Station, New Jersey. He's on the East Coast here. He's been traveling the United States for the past, get this folks, 16 years as a professional baseball player. And He's also a West Coast sales manager and now is a coach. Through years of deep introspective work following a perspective altering health care. Oh, you changed your perspective because you had a health health care scare. Yeah, your own, right, right. You had a problem in your life. I did. And I, we're, I'm looking forward to hearing about that because I didn't quite get the wording. I should have gotten that more precise before. Yeah. So this new process includes intensive coaching, multiple leadership platforms, and personal introspective guided and unguided deep mental work, Tim began coaching with his own practice. So it's Pahooter Health and Wellness. That must have been your baseball nickname game. <laughs> it was a nickname. Pahooter. I was in middle school, yeah. <laughs> and when they weren't calling you other names, right? <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, yeah, better than most. <laughs> yeah, right. And so Tim has been working with the Life Mapping Platform under the mentorship of Jim Brown since the summer of 2017 and became the first affiliated Life Mapping coach himself, where he's teaching others Life Mapping skills in the U.S. in January of 2018, just around the corner here. That's right. That's Tim right. has officially accepted full-time mapping clients as well as training future life mapping coaches. He can be reached Facebook, Twitter, message. We're going to have all of his links right there in the show notes. And you can do an outright phone call, his preferred meeting. And we're going to have, do you want me to put the cell phone number on the show notes? Or do you 
Um, I think I'll just I'll just put your website up there and let them do it that way. Yeah, we'll do it that way. I mean, part of uh, what's included in the life mapping starter package, which really is what starts anybody creating their own life map, is a 30-minute phone call with a licensed life mapping coach, which would be me or one of my colleagues that I've trained. Fantastic. So we fantastic. would end up on the phone anyway, regardless if somebody were to create their own life map. Well, here's a professional baseball player going all around the United States playing ball. I want to talk to you a little bit about baseball. I was really a serious baseball player. Oh, were you? In high school. All right. <laughs> All right. But anyway, I look forward to hearing about that. And, I, and the next thing is then tell us about how you made the switch from baseball. You hinted a little bit about that, and, and you had a big transformational moment there. But let's start with the baseball situation. Who did sure. you play for, and, and what, did you, what position were you playing? Well, I was drafted twice in my career, once out of high school by the Pittsburgh Pirates, which I declined, and I went to Seton Hall University instead. And then I was drafted again after my senior year by the Washington Nationals. I played with them in their minor leagues for eight years, Mm -hmm. and then I played one year of independent baseball in South Dakota in a town called Sioux Falls. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Oh, that would be fun. Yeah, that was fun. It was a good time. South Dakota, great people. So what position did you play? I played first and third, and like what you alluded to, the travel in baseball is pretty well documented. There wasn't, for a period of that nine years, I wasn't in a town for more than three or four days during the the regular season, and the rest of the time I was on a bus going somewhere else. Oh, really? I didn't realize it was that bad. I knew there was travel, but I didn't realize it was that bad. So you can't really be married. Where are you from? I'm not on the East Coast, by the way. I'm in Denver at the moment. Oh, you are? I'm I'm in Virginia Beach. You're Virginia. So what's yeah. the closest big league team to where you live? Washington. D.C., right. Yeah. So a team like the Braves comes into D.C. to play against the Nationals. They're there for three or four games, and then they leave. They mm-hmm. get on a plane. They go to another city. It might not be back to Atlanta. Uh-huh. Yet. They might go to three other cities before they go home. Then they go to Atlanta, and they're there for maybe a week playing two different teams, and then they go somewhere else. I got you. So yeah. They're really not. Like you may play for the Nationals, you may play for the Atlanta Braves, but you're not in Atlanta. Yeah. You might be in Atlanta half the time. Yeah, yeah. The rest of the time you're on the road. And you're doing what you can to keep yourself fit, even though you're riding a lot. Trying to, yeah. It's, just, it's a combination of a lot of different things. Poor habits, obviously, which I'm sure you deal a great deal with in your psychoanalytical <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But then games end at 11 o'clock at night and you're stopping at truck stops on the road where there's like a McDonald's and a Wendy's and a oh my gosh convenience store and you, you got a half hour before the bus gets back on the road again and let's just grab something real quick. and You know, I think we could do something for depression for baseball players. <laughs> <laughs> we could have a whole thing because when you, know you think what? about I, it, you're totally alone. You're not, by, you know, you're not with your family. Your wife isn't riding in the bus with you. Yeah, it's a really interesting um, situation because you are put with a group of guys. You are with 25, 30 other people that are in this, going through that experience together. But you're right. You're segregated from everything that you've known for a long time, and you're basically put in a new family, and you live with them for six months. And then you well, it's kind of – and it's very similar to Navy pilots. We're down here in Virginia Beach, and we – Navy pilots don't come in and see a shrink, I can tell you that. But I have <laughs> – I have seen, you know, it's like seals. We have some seals come in once in a while, but they kind of come in the back door and go out the back door, you know, (laughs) and and the same way with pilots, because, you know, who wants the defamation of of seeing a psychiatrist, you know, but they're very alone. They're by themselves, you know, right. Right. That stigma of being tough extends to baseball players as well. And it's Mm -hmm. interesting because we're very accepting of baseball coaching when it comes to physical things in the swing or fielding ground balls or the way we're approaching at bats even. But when it comes to life, admitting like fault from that yeah. standpoint of view and thinking of, that's different. It's totally different. But see, that is why this conversation, my man, is going to be so interesting. <laughs> right because on. the truth of the matter is what we're talking about is a metaphor for life with guys in general and some women, but it's a guy problem. Because, I mean, just even look at what's going on in the national political scene. I right. Mean, what is going on there? I mean, are guys in denial? Would you say they're in denial? I would say they are. I mean, you know. Denial about what? So life. <laughs> the meaning so of their contribution, about. who they are as people. I mean, that's a big one. But I mean, I see some people that are out there performing, not really having a meaningful expression of, of themselves as human beings with, 
with the people that they represent. I mean, they're just out there talking, you know. Yeah, and that from like a psychoanalytical point of view, looking at that from a third party, it, it is pretty fascinating to watch the overall like societal dynamics that we have and we've oh, developed. Yeah. Oh, that's from, uh, you know, it's kind of an echo of what we grew up with of that you're tough guys don't cry and mm -hmm. women are the ones that have feelings and then we yeah. separate this masculine and feminine thing and then we feel like we need to fit in one of the boxes on who we identify with when the truth is we all have both of those sides inside of all of us and we both yeah. have access to both of those things and we're all we're all masculine and feminine and we're all kind of yeah. connected so what was your transformational moment? I mean, now we got the, we got the grid. We got the yeah. work. We can see what was going on. Some of it. When, did, some you, of when it. did you fall <laughs> off the train? <laughs> well, uh, about when I retired from baseball, honestly. I mean, my identity had been wrapped up in baseball since I was five or six years old. My, the only answer to the question that I've, I was ever, you know, the question of what are you going to be when you grow up, the only answer I ever really had to that question was a professional baseball player. And... I dedicated my life to that. And there were a lot of other things I did. Obviously, I went to school. I went to college. I uh, had other jobs. But my focus was baseball, and those were the things that I had to do in order to keep baseball going and playing for as long as I could. And I was always Tim Pahuda, and I was a baseball player, and I was uh, going to college at Seton Hall University. And then when I had 30 years old and I retired and the baseball player part was gone and I was just Tim Pahuda. I didn't really, I mean, I was just kind of looking around feeling lost or I didn't you really didn't know have an identity. Your, your identity. Uh, uh, well, yeah, I wasn't a baseball player anymore and that's all I had ever been for as long as I could remember. But you had one skill set, Tim, I'm going to tell you that right now. And it shows just in a brief conversation. Does baseball it? players as a group have the gift of gab. Okay. <laughs> They are able, because they're sitting in that doggone dugout. <laughs> it might be right. They you got stuff to poke each other, elbow <laughs> poke. They got the nickname thing going down, and yeah, everybody yeah. has the gift of gab. I've, I've worked with baseball players. I work with professional baseball players in my life. We've had the opportunity to see some people when I was doing brain scans, guys that got bean with a ball. We look at their brain, and we did uh, in D.C. We, I was chief psychiatrist in a, a brain scan center up there with uh, Amon Clinics. And uh, the people that came in, the professionals that were baseball players, they say he's a baseball player, this is going to be fun because we're going we're gonna to have a good conversation. <laughs> you know, because, you know, you do learn how to talk when you're out there. Now, football players don't have that because they're not. Well, I wonder why that is. Less interaction with the fan base? Like yeah. in general? I mean, well, no, they don't have the interaction with each other. They're, they're, oh. Their interaction with each other is you call the plays and you carry the ball and that's it. There's no sitting down and talk with each other going on. There may be a little bit. But, you know, you have the coverage of the dugout where the fans can't see you. <laughs> where, that might be true. You know what I'm talking about. And, no, a lot happens in the dugout. And when you're sitting out there on the bench, everybody knows what's going on. The cameras are on. You can't be poking people and joking them and <laughs> swatting them in the head and playing games. Whereas when you're down there in the dugout, it's a whole different world going on. And you learn how to – I think my experience with baseball players is they're a very articulate, very bright group of guys. And men and women, I haven't really met any women. Uh, women softball players, they're also very interesting to talk to because they, they have a certain team, and when you're sitting down, you have that time to really chat and you think about the game. So what you're doing, you brought a skill set in. Pardon me for taking some of your time. I want to you're talk. You're fine. You're fine. But the bottom line is you have a sense that there's a game going on. How are we going to play it? You're thinking about the structure of where you're going to go and what you're going to do. I think you had a skill set that you weren't quite – aware of that was there abiding within you because you didn't know how to take that skill set to the next level. It's really interesting that you're in life mapping because, and quote unquote coaching, when you're talking about coaching, yeah. what are you talking about? You know, managing the game. Yeah. Yeah. You're not wrong. And if, and if you were to use that, stretch that metaphor out as in life is a game and we're all just playing our own yeah. version of this game, then, yeah. then, then it's really easy yeah. to take the same attitude and mental approach that we had in baseball and layered on top of life and mm -hmm. start to understand how you're creating the type of at-bats you're having in life and mm -hmm. the success you're having in the score on the scoreboard, uh, yeah. if that's the way you want to see it. And then attitude and your perseverance. These are things that are built into your bones. Right, mm -hmm. and they all affect the way the outcomes of the game, right? Your, Absolutely. The attitude is affecting 
our perception of our reality. And you, you talk about a lot. I've seen a few of your YouTube videos where you're talking about language and the words that we're using. From an NLP standpoint of view, which is largely what life mapping is built on, it's CBT and NLP, the, like, the way we're speaking out loud to each other, to ourselves, is obviously affecting our thoughts, and we're giving ourselves orders as we're going about our day. And then our subconscious mind is just kind of carrying out this thing behind the scenes when we're not really even paying attention to it or aware of it. So with let, that, like... Let me approach, interrupt you for just a second, because you said some words, and some of our listeners don't know what NLP is and linguistic programming and, and CBT. Take a quick moment, because I thought what you said was so absolutely essential that when you're saying that, let's build that a little bit further, because we got people, we're now in 102 countries. So not everybody okay. is... Okay. <laughs> all, right. all right, all right, I'm sorry. So say, no, that's okay. I just wanted to, to take a moment to spell that out and then, and then say what you said again, because it's so relevant. Very good. Yeah, you're fine. I got excited. So CBT is cognitive behavioral therapy, and that's basically the way our behaviors are affecting our thoughts is the way I see it. And that's mm -hmm. as simple as you can make that explanation. And there's books and books and volumes written mm -hmm. on cognitive behavioral therapy. But it's our thoughts and it's our brain and it's the way our behaviors are kind of affecting those thoughts. NLP is neuro linguistic program, which you just said, and that's the way our language is affecting those thoughts. So between those two things, we have a combination of the language we're using and the behaviors that we have in our lives, which are largely habitual, right? If they're built on autopilot and patterns of behavior that we've installed from a long time ago. So we're taking a look in this process of life mapping, which is a six week long like, program one on one that I coach people through and developing these life maps into the powerful tool. We're looking at the behaviors that people have in their lives. And as the coach, I'm listening for the language that they're using. And it's the language that they're using with me. And I know that when we are away from each other, because we're only meeting once a week for an hour, when we're separate from each other, I know that that language that they're using is the language that they're using with themselves inside their head. And that's what's creating things in their life. And by me giving the feedback in the moment and by asking the questions, which are all based on the life map that they've created, it just stirs the conversation in a different way and creates an opportunity for the client to have like a different perspective shift because they're just seeing things from a different point of view. Fantastic. Now let me ask you a point of clarification because this whole life mapping thing, people don't know about it. It's a good reason no. to have you on. This is a big reason to have you on because what you're doing is very important. I mean, what you said is, is really critical to a lot of people. They're just trying to find some quick answer. How can I get from here to there? in some relatively uncomplicated way without knowing uh, about the Oedipus complex. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So let's talk about that. I, you see them, when you actually see them, you do it virtually as well, probably. You do it. Yeah, it's, it's built largely as a remote business, so I can work with clients anywhere in the world from wherever I am. I have clients all over the country, and whether I'm in Mexico or Colorado or L.A. or New Jersey, I can work with clients in Chicago or Milwaukee or LA. Okay, so you talk with them a program you said was six weeks or six months? Yeah, so I have a six-week program. We have a six-week program that goes along with the life map, and it's about developing it into a tool and di just digging it deeper and refining it even further and getting more and more clarification on it. Mm -hmm. The act of creating a life map is made as simple as we can possibly make it for the reason of we want as many people as we can to be doing this type of introspective thought where they're analyzing themselves. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Um, I mean, it's just so true. So many people wind up. And in fact, I was just talking with another guy just before we started talking to you. Uh, and you know, this really interesting guy, he's, he's a celebrity out in, celebrity coach out in LA. We're talking about celebrity suicide. Now, why are the celebrities killing themselves? I mean, you know, it's just an amazing thing. I'm telling you, he and I are thinking about a way we could possibly address this. We have some ideas about it. But uh, one of the things that happens is exactly what you said. They reach a point somewhere where that perception of themselves is an endpoint and they don't have a place to go. They're no longer playing baseball. Even if they're successful, if there's a certain level of I'm okay with the success. I really don't know where else to go. They've reached the end point. They can't retire. They don't have any place to go. I think that what you're talking about is absolutely essential for a lot of people at different levels, including celebrity, possible what you might call pre-suicide, people who are thinking about it. You know, one of the things that's 
important to me. Pardon me for going on a little bit, Tim. And you're just saying some things that are very interesting. No, you're fine. I always ask the question when I got somebody in the office, every single initial interview, I ask this question. And I break brain function down into three subsets. This isn't mine. This is everybody. I mean, this is okay. what other people have said. Thinking, feeling, and acting. Well, if you got three different sections going on with your brain and suicide has come in, or maybe it isn't formal suicide, but it could be, I just don't want to be here any longer, which is like suicide. Mm. So I tell a person, look, even though, in fact, you wouldn't do it, the action, even though you wouldn't do the action, are you thinking about it? And if you think about it, the next tag after that is, first of all, I tell them, hey, great. If you're thinking about it, you just gave me a job. Thank you very much. <laughs> Now, the next level is not to trivialize it, but to market. Yeah. And we market, is it every day? Is it once a week? Is it once a month? Because my job as a person working with you is to get that out of there. If I don't get that out of there with you and a partnership with you, I'm not doing my job. It's as simple as that. So I'm like, I'm going to ask about thinking about it, which is kind of what you're talking about. Because if they're thinking about it, they are in a bad place. And I think that's way before suicide. How often have they thought about that as an option? Yeah, I, well, I, I'm sure it's very individual, but I, I think you're right that that does actually act on that thought, has had that thought long time previous to that. Yeah. Like the thought was pre- before. Pre-morbid, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Right, right, yeah, exactly, however you want to put it. Sorry to interrupt you. I just got all excited about that point <laughs> of being lost. Like I was identifying with you being lost without an identity and then other people being lost because I think we all get lost in certain places in our lives. You know, when there's a transition, I had an identity, like for example, I wouldn't say I was lost per se, but in a way I was, you know, when I was working up at Amen Clinic with in DC doing brain imaging. Well, I learned that tool. I got that tool. That's right. good. Right. I was flying back and forth to DC on a regular basis. And then I said, okay, do I want to continue to do this? How long am I going to continue to do this? Right. No, I think I've got to make some changes. So when, I, when that happens, then I have to figure out who I'm going to be next. And I think that's a bit trivial and it's certainly personal, but I think everybody goes through those kinds of changes. That's why something like what you're doing is so darn valuable because what I changed next, I didn't have a life map. I do right, not, right. I kind of have a life map now because I'm thinking more about all this stuff in a, in a larger picture because I'm definitely, I'm definitely on a mission. Anybody that reads my mission statement knows I'm, I'm on a path. So I've got a life map, but, the issue is I didn't have one then is what I'm saying. And you have to yeah. work to find it. You got a guy like you, it would have been very helpful for me to have six sessions with you back then. Forget the fact that I'm trained in psychoanalysis and board certified in psychiatry. I need to figure out what was next. Yeah, for you and any kind of tool that you can use that will help you get a clear vision on that, on what you want to do, on what my clients want to do, on what I want to do, like that clarifying that vision helps you get up in the morning because then you know what you're headed towards and it's easy to take the next step and it's easy to not get caught up in little shit that happens day to day because this is not that's just today mm -hmm. we're focused on down the road on something bigger than this and we got reasons behind that too that are mm -hmm. have been thought about mm -hmm. it's not just i want to travel well <laughs> why well you know what i mean why do you want to travel what's, what's the travel? purpose yeah, right, right. And when you identify the why, then it's easy to go, okay, now I, I definitely want to do that because mm -hmm. now I know why. Such as that's such an like important, important point. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I'm going to take a quick I, break here. I'm going to ask you a question. Just say, we'll take a break. But I, a question occurs to me right here, and that is identifying with your process in your own personal development. And I'm going to ask you kind of a hard question when we get back, and that is, what are the experiences that you've had since you've started life mapping? that have really changed your process as a coach? This is a personal question. What is it that's sort of like, okay, I've got to really do this a different way. This was a big learning experience for me. So I'm going to see if you can pop in with something like that because I think it helps personalize how the person themselves, like I was sharing with myself, how, how we come out of where that area of not knowing and not knowing what we're going to do next. So folks, we're going to be back in just a moment. Today, the world of mind, science, psychiatry, and mental health is rapidly changing with innovative, comprehensive testing that takes both patients and practitioners into a new world of measured details. 
with useful, understandable, and remarkably actionable plans. The key phrase here is cost effective. Testing also introduces a key parallel word, predictability. Psychiatric treatment failure, especially after multiple medications and our brief hospitalizations, arises directly from the complexity of measurable brain-body imbalances and impediments that explicitly interfere with medical outcomes and create costly difficulties with inadequately informed supplement and medication trials over time. Great Plains provides a leadership team of biomedical experts with advanced laboratory insights approved nationally both by the FDA and CLIA laboratory certifications and is available internationally for both public and medical professions. Great Plains Laboratory is the primary laboratory we've used at CoreSight for years with excellent customer service for both patients and medical colleagues. They are on the spot, they get it every time. In addition, they provide exemplary training modules, which are webinars and conferences, in an effort to broaden practice perspectives wherever you live. Do follow up on one of these complimentary test offers today at http greatplainslaboratory.com forward slash cbj yeah that's core brain journal cbj well here we are back again folks and i can tell you tim i don't really feel like i'm putting a guy like you on the spot at all okay because i know you have the gift of gab i know you've had so many things thrown at you including orange peels and bananas (laughs) a guy talking to you across the country about this kind of thing is a piece of cake. You can yeah, answer. No problem. I'm not, I, I, just, I can just hang up and say I lost signal if it gets to <laughs> <laughs> That's another way to handle it, right? So what do you think would be a challenge that was transformative for you after you began coaching and you learned life mapping? It was something like, hey, this is a whole nother thing that really affirms where I'm going or has changes where I'm going. Do you have any, any thoughts about that? You know, the question you asked before we went on the break really made me think about what is the big time change or like the uh, core idea change behind everything that I've done over the past three or four years that I've been like genuinely working on. And that's since the heart issue that I had mentioned that, that little health scare that I had in 2000. Let's talk about that. We didn't get into it. Please do get into it. I was out in Los Angeles and I was a regional sales manager at that point. So I was managing sales on the Western third of the U S for a lighting manufacturer. So I was traveling about 50% of the time then living in Los Angeles. And at least I was traveling by plane at that point. I I had gotten out of, (laughs) and uh, (laughs) I was making a lot more money actually too than I was playing baseball, which was a nice step up. Yeah. But uh, after traveling around that part of the country, probably six or seven times to all the major cities, I had, I mean, I was tired of traveling and I was starting to look around at what I was bringing into my life and why. And one of the things that I left baseball with as a result of, I don't know, as a result of my minor league career or my status as a baseball player, the way it went, I mean, I never really made a lot of money playing baseball. I never mm-hmm. made a lot of money playing baseball. Mm-hmm. And I left with some mentality of scarcity and mm-hmm. wanting to make money and live a comfortable life. I mean, yeah, at yeah. that point, I was 30 years old. I'd been a professional athlete for a really long time, and I never felt comfortable about it. I was always anxious about the next meal on some level, you know what I mean? And uh, accepted the position of that that regional sales position. It was largely based on money and a lack of other opportunities as I saw it. So Mm -hmm. it was really the first kind of decision I made based on money. And then from instead of chasing like baseball was a dream that I had from when I was a kid and I was passionate about the game and I loved and I loved being around teammates in the clubhouse and even the bus rides that you mentioned, like Mm -hmm. you're spending time with your brothers, your family on this journey that nobody will ever understand you know what the savannah sand gnats from 2006 went through except for like 25 guys that were there you know what yeah, I mean? yeah yeah and um after living in la for a while and still traveling around and by that time i'd been on the road for in between 10 and 15 years of traveling i i was tired of traveling i was tired of making decisions that were padding my bank account and you know, raising the network of a company that I, I didn't really, really see us doing a lot of good other than 
<laughs> you're making money, which, is, mm-hmm. <laughs> which was nice. Again, well, you I, were doing products or sales. You weren't doing service. You were servicing customers, but they were products. They weren't a service. At yeah. Time. And part of me looks back at that and wonders if my perspective was just like that. And really, if I, I mean, look, we looked at it, we were doing good things. We're designing nice spaces and they were cool buildings and mm-hmm. we're helping people switch from old lighting methodologies to LED lighting, which okay. is saving a lot of energy for the world and the country and carbon footprint and all of that. But yeah. I wasn't really focused on that at the time. So yeah. my perspective then was the only reason I'm doing this is for money. And gotcha. the gotcha. better I do at it, the bigger the territory gets, the more we sell and the more issues end up coming back to me. So I'm working in LA, our company's in New Jersey and I wake up in the morning to three hours worth of emails because everybody's been in the office on the East Coast for that long. And they're mm-hmm. usually like problems or things that I need to deal with when mm-hmm. I wake up. Mm-hmm. It was the point where I was dreading looking at my phone. And you start, I started thinking at that point, like, well, great. Now I've worked myself from $50,000 up to $120,000. I've got a lot more responsibility in a bigger territory and I'm traveling more, but the problems are getting bigger and I'm getting more and more stressed and I'm feeling more and more like, if this is what it's all about, I'm ready to go. I've had mm-hmm. enough. I've mm-hmm. chased my passion in baseball for a long time. I'm now making money and buying a shit I don't need uh, to, <laughs> I don't know, to yeah. fill some hole that I have or impress a bunch of people that I don't really give a shit about. And mm-hmm. I'm searching for happiness external of myself, which is a um, flaw that a lot of people get caught up in. And I certainly was caught up in it myself. And um found at that point that I saw where it could go at the company. I mean, I was in a great position there and I could see myself being the vice president of the company, being the president of the company, but it wasn't somewhere that I wanted to head. Mm -hmm. And until I like, I'm in this spot where I've had enough and I'm ready to call it quits. We were already talking about that. So say that I was in a position where I wanted for it to be over and Mm -hmm. I didn't obviously. And I had, tore my meniscus when I was playing tennis out in Los Angeles at this time. And I was playing tennis like four or five times a week trying to get back in shape. Mm. Lose weight. I gained, I was up to close to 300 pounds at one you're point. You're kidding me. Yeah, yeah. You don't look like you're 300 pounds. I can't imagine a guy like you being 300 pounds. No, I'm not. I'm a, I played most of my career around 250 pounds. And like I had mentioned earlier, before we got on the air, I had bad habits of eating and my motivation for exercise and working out was getting in shape to play baseball. So when that was, when baseball was gone, that was kind of gone too. Like what the hell am I going to work out for? I've been beating my body up for 10 years for baseball. And now baseball is not there. So what am I doing it for? And um, I've gotten a place where I want to get back in shape. I want to get back under control of all of that. And mentally I was still kind of shot. I wasn't healthy. And I tore my meniscus and that put me in the doctor's office to get cleared for anesthesia before I would just get a scope on my knee. And a scope wasn't a big deal because I had already had ACL surgery when I was playing for the Nationals and missed a whole season doing that. So this is just one more little small surgery. It's going to be six weeks and I'll be back to playing golf. And yeah, yeah. So not a big deal. But bradycardia are you familiar with that yes i am but tell, tell our audience about it is it? my limited medical understanding of it is it's just a super low heart rate and my super heart, low heart is exactly yep. what it is i mean yeah. you know and it can come up quite spontaneously you know a person doesn't know what the heck it's caused by no so right so i'm in there when your heart beats slow that's a big deal because you don't get blood up to your brain so then you start having dizzy things and all kinds of in your and you're woozing around you look like you're intoxicated <sighs> You don't, yeah, know, and, you don't know when it's going to hit you. Right. And specific to what was going on with my situation going into surgery, they were worried about putting me under anesthesia because if my heart started beating too slow, they were worried it would stop. No. Oh, ouch. So my heart was beating at 40 beats per minute or 42 beats per minute in the first doctor's appointment. Six weeks later, I had gone from doctor to doctor to doctor to doctor, not really getting more information other than something's wrong, something's wrong, we don't know. and. During that period is when I started to realize, like, I was scared of dying. I didn't want to die. Mm -hmm. And I realized I don't want to die. There's nothing. I wasn't thinking clearly. Mm -hmm. The truth is I wasn't happy with the way I was spending my time where I was living my life. And prior to that, playing baseball, even though I wasn't making any money, I was passionate about what I was doing. You were alive, yeah. And I was alive, exactly. And I was dedicated to it. And I I was willing to go, to go for it. And... It got to a point where I wasn't anymore. And it was really just 
the choices that I was making, largely based on money, were leaving me unsatisfied or mm -hmm. feeling like I was not having a positive contribution. And that was the biggest thing that I was lacking. When yeah, I was you were putting a lot of Band-Aids on yourself. You had some superficial things going on and you were putting Band-Aids on them. And you didn't, right. your question is, how do you get down to the ultimate answer for where you need to go next? Yeah. yeah. And that's when I started doing like work and I started jumping into all kinds of things that are personal development and self growth and started to think about myself. And mm -hmm. largely I'm a, I'm a person of service. If you've ever done an Enneagram test, I'm a big fan of that. I'm a two, I'm a giver and I'll mm -hmm. give everything until I've got nothing left. And that's what I would do. And in 2015, when I decided that everything needed to shift and I needed to do things differently, I started looking at myself rather than looking at the outside world, looking externally. Mm -hmm. And um, that's when I started making some like really big life transformations and really started having success and shifts in the way that I handled myself, like in the world and in my relationships, which I discovered is for me is the most important part of life. I mean, when, when people are on their deathbed and they ask them what, <laughs> no, it's never about the money or the things that yeah. God, it's always about the people and the relationships and the community and the, the love. So, um, so true. I started thinking a lot about that and I started thinking a lot about my relationships that I've had in the past. And I've dated women just about all over the country because I've, <laughs> I've and that's what you were doing. <laughs> <laughs> and I've dated great women all over the country. Good people, yeah. I mean, obviously none of those relationships have worked out. And the common denominator was myself. And at that point, I'm looking at myself and starting to think about why that, why those relationships wouldn't work out. Like a lot of relationships, there was always arguments or fights, right? About whatever, everything. Yeah. yeah. And um, I started looking at baseball and my success in that from a competitive standpoint of view and what, what made me have this career that was so successful just in terms of length and the things that I was able to do. And that attitude of, it wasn't just an attitude of winning, but it was an attitude of beating the other guy and mm -hmm. coming together like with my team and beating those other guys. It extended beyond baseball and it was all driven by love in the first place. When I was a kid and I did well in baseball and I got high fives and trophies and slaps on the back and I don't want to give, like, I don't want to take away my own personal responsibility, but at that point, like I had chosen then that that's the way that I bring love into my life is to do well and to be somebody, a great athlete or a winner. And then people love me for that. Yeah. And that's when you're five or six years old and you choose that or you decide that. That's a way to get it. Absolutely. Totally agree with you. And but then you stretch that out for your entire life. Yeah, but see, you're not deep baseball. enough. You got to give yourself a little break. You're oh, deep, no, you're deep guy. You give yourself a break now. I know, but I'm saying for listeners. What yeah, happens, oh, of everybody, course. All of us have to give ourselves a break for being a kid, you know? Absolutely. What, if whatever it works, when you're a kid, if it works, you're not thinking that deeply about things. I mean, even though no, you're no, a deep no. guy, you were a deep guy then, but you, you didn't have a source for actually figuring out the answers. Now, yeah, you've yeah. had a coach or two. Oh, yeah. Hey, that's not how it works, buddy. Don't yeah. do that. <laughs> but they would have still been focused on how you looked in baseball. They weren't talking to yeah. you about your life. Now, you may have had a really good coach once in a while and said, look, if you're going to go out there with these guys, you are going to get screwed up, buddy. But yeah. that's still not what's your purpose. Where are you going? Who are you? It's not that deep. It's like just – it's sort of like here's a different set of rules and here's another rule that can make you successful. And kids do that. I mean, you know, a lot of us can carry that through our lives until we come up to like, hey, that's not what it's all about. Yeah, I mean, and that realization that that competitive attitude was like what did great things for me in my career, but it also put me in, in this, or I was doing the, in relationships, like personal relationships with women where I would start arguments or fights in relationships to win them and then expect love <laughs> because I just won. You know, people love me when I win. Yeah, right, right. right. <laughs> I bet you some of your girlfriends had a, had a good laugh over that one. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've actually like reconciled with a lot of them. I'm friends with them now. I talk to them all the time. And <laughs> I've told them that, like, like, why didn't you love me when I was beating you in all those fights that I was creating? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> uh. It's like having that and releasing that uh, idea of competition or needing to beat somebody else or comparing, always comparing myself comparison. to the other first baseman or to the other person or whatever it is like that. 
Comparison is the thief of joy, and I say that all the time, like up to my neck and comparing mm-hmm. myself to everybody else. I don't know, to check the score, to see where I was. And that like totally left me inauthentically somebody other than myself. And I wasn't worried about being me and having a good time and enjoying my time here for however long it could last. Mm-hmm. I was worried about, well, what are they doing? What are they doing? And how do I, you know what I mean? And it's not. Absolutely. It's, re- it's reductionistic and it's reptilian thinking. You would like this from Daniel Kahneman, Thinking Fast and Slow. I don't know if you're familiar with that book, but you would love it because you're a coach. And I very frequently refer to reptilian thinking because a reptile is going to, I'm going to eat you. I'm going to make love to you or I'm going to kill you, (laughs) (laughs) whatever. And there's nothing else going on because it's all a duality. When you're living in a dualistic world, everything is right and wrong. There is no gray. And so either you're right and they're wrong and that's it. So that's going to be, I'm going to prove that I'm right. And then people get into endless arguments to prove nothing in yeah, a world yeah. that's really exceedingly gray. <laughs> <laughs> I find myself, uh, the, most, the only arguments I really find myself in now are the arguments between my clients and themselves. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, right. Like yeah. They're giving themselves a limitation, and I'm like, no, you can do that. And they're fighting me on the limitation. <laughs> that they've given themselves and I'm in between them and themselves. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's a good place to be though. Yeah, because sure. you're always going to win that one. You're always yeah, going to win. Defending their best interests and they realize that eventually, <laughs> even if it's not in that conversation, they'll call me the next day and go, oh, I, I get yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> so you're just taking them away. You're taking them a click into the complexity of life. You're dealing with multiple variables that they have tried to manage by using labels and simplistic thinking. That's what racism is. That's what all yeah. the whole... Prejudicial uh, attitude that just judging... Yeah. Prejudicial uh, is black and white, yeah. Prejudicial, right. It's based, on the, it's based on our past experience. So there may have been like some one experience way down the road that was the very first one and it was emotional and we installed some belief based on it. But in reality, every situation that we see every second of every day is different than every other one we'll ever have or have ever had. So we mm-hmm. can't compare meeting this black person to meeting that black person from yeah. years ago. That just doesn't make any sense. And we wouldn't yeah. do that when we think it through, when it's the pattern and it's the behavior and it's something that we practice for a really t- long time. It just happens when it happens. And without us noticing it, which is the awareness piece, is what coaches and doctors and counselors, they do is they give feedback to provide awareness to their clients so that they can start to see their own behavior and how it's creating their own perception of their reality and then they're in a, just a totally different place. And all we've done is shift thinking, right? And that's what we do. Well said. Very well said. And that is what the problem is. I mean, basically, and the complexity of it is you're dealing, you're now in a wonderful place because you can deal with not only you got the opportunity to deal not only with the client, because then you're in that little adversarial place of them with themselves and who they really are with who they think they are. But you also have the opportunity as a coach for other coaches. That must be even more interesting in a certain respect because you get deep people who are intrinsically deep already. Right. right. And then we can go deeper and deeper with each other. Because... And they get more and more messed up because they, yeah. <laughs> they have to work through what their theory was in terms of reality. You know, like I, got this theory, I got this whole theory I've been trained for. And I, just, I got my PhD on this, buddy. Don't mess with me because... <laughs> <laughs> That's what it, I actually, I love those little moments of cognitive dissonance where you, yeah. <laughs> you say something just a little bit different than somebody's belief and they're just like, just yeah, off right. their feet for a second. Like, wait, yeah, they, wait a second. They, wait. Go, they fall off the chair, they get on the floor, <laughs> and they have a convulsion. I can't believe you said this to me. I thought you were a different person. <laughs> actually, what they're saying is I had you boxed up. In a safe yeah, place right, in my mind. Right. I knew and, that if I said this to you, then you would say that. But you didn't say that to me. <laughs> yeah. And I wasn't even aware of that covert contract. I was just being myself. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. And then that whole authenticity. It's one of the reasons I love doing these things and having a great conversation with a guy like you. Because we can't screw up this conversation. It's not no. possible to screw it up. Right. Because all we're doing is saying, you're saying your experience in your life. I'm saying some of my experience in my life. And we're talking about what works and what doesn't work. And reductionistic thinking does not work. Complexity thinking is more challenging because there are more variables involved, but it's also significantly more humbling 
Because if you're really more humble, you're more authentic. If you're less humble, you're less authentic because you're posing as a person who actually is beyond the reality of the moment. I'm really beyond the reality of this moment. I'm really cool. You know what yeah. I'm saying? <laughs> you yourself are screwed up. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry to say that to you. Yeah. <laughs> I've already I, figured all this out. This is just. <laughs> I mean, I have seen so many professionals do this with people. It's just unbelievable. You, you see well, this I, happen in psychiatric meetings. I mean, national psychiatric meetings. People do this with each other. It's like, what am I doing here? This is completely unbelievable. Right. Yeah. And if you're not learning, that's one of the things that I love and you alluded to it already is working with other coaches and being in the position where now we're training people like qualified coaches that have been even coaching longer than I've been coaching to you mapping with their clients. Like it's putting me in a position to learn like so much from people that are my clients. Technically they're paying me money, but they're my coaches in this situation too. I'm learning from them just as much as they're learning from me. And it's a good, yeah. it's, the coaching and client relationship is, it's a give and get. I mean, it's a give and giver's gain situation where I'm here to show up for you and to help you see things differently if you're not liking the way you see them right now. But it's all the responsibility of the person. Well, you know, so much of what we're talking about, to summarize it a little bit, and at the risk of sounding somewhat pedantic, I apologize, but Really, what we do as human beings is we're moving through as we grow. We're literally moving through different realities that are realities of our minds, that are perceptions of the circumstance that may or may not be realistically accurate when you get into the reality. So we carry these levels of perceptions and thought with us without being aware of it. And then we have a change like you leaving baseball, like me leaving brain imaging. Yeah, yeah. And you go into another reality, which is, okay, what's my identity in this reality? Yeah, and then right. a guy like you helps a person come down to, it doesn't matter what reality, and this is who I actually am. I mean, I'm not this way in every reality. You know, I'm not this way as a coach, or I'm not this way as a husband, or yeah, I'm this, yeah. this is who I actually am. I've decided right. who I am. This is what my life's meaning is going to be. This is what I'm assuming that what you're talking about with life mapping is all about because you're saying you're saying have a conscious force within yourself of what the meaning of your life is. I'm saying you already do and you can tap into it and life mapping is a tool that can help you do that and you already have every answer you already need. You just need to have the courage to access it on the inside of yourself. <laughs> well, that's refreshing. I'm glad you reframed it because I was thinking you might get it. And you're saying, no, Parker, you've already got it. <laughs> yeah, you already got it. <laughs> yeah. That, so one of the things that you mentioned about being over, did you say overeducated and under-delivered? Is that what you said? Yeah, right, yeah. yeah overeducated and under-trained, you know. Yeah, I think I heard, uh, I went to a, it was like a one-day workshop where Gary V and... Uh, Tony Robbins and a few other people were speaking here in Denver. And he was like, yeah, you know, Gary Vee was talking and he, he said, you know what my hope is for the end of this? And he cursed a lot more than I'm going to. <laughs> <laughs> That's Gary Vandercheck, folks, uh, for you. <laughs> He's like, I hope this is the last workshop or last class you ever go to i hope you realize that you've got it all already like you know oh, that's cool more yeah. information or more workshops or more like you need to take what you've already got you're already you've already been learning all this and go help other people grow with it. Tony would have loved that. That's a Tony. Those guys are on the same path. Yeah. Yeah. I think so too. That's probably why they do those. those yeah. Uh, I've never, I've never had the chance to be with them together. That would have been a fun meeting. Oh. It was fun. It was a good time. Yeah. They, and there's, you want to talk about learning in the eight hour day. It was, that was yeah. a, I mean, You're a different person at the end of the day. <laughs> like, Oh my gosh. Have you done some uh, like full immersion types trainings? No, where you go? No, no, the most I've ever done full immersion is uh, training in karate. We do a full weekend in the cold water at Nags wow. Head, and we'd uh, climb up Jockey's Ridge on our bellies and stay up till two o'clock and wake up in the morning and and do full contact, and then go out in the water and. The thing was really fun. It's sort of, it's a little bit like baseball. I mean, you guys are much closer than we were as a group, but you work out with the guys and you have different people with different skill levels. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's really funny because I had this one guy who was like a third degree black belt who was a good guy, very, very quick and very fast. And uh, we were sparring one time because even as a young guy, you wind up 
sparring with the bigger guys. Yeah. And, you know, I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to really get this guy. I'm going to, you know. <laughs> and while I'm thinking that, his foot is sitting right up on the side of my head. <laughs> and he didn't knock my head off. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, that was very convincing. You know, he didn't even slap me. It just landed right there. Like, where did it come from, you know? <laughs> so then this same guy, we're down in the water, down in Nag's head. And the waves are out there. And, the, and the Sensei Yamada is a seventh generation samurai guy. So he's, he's a very serious player. And he's out there in the water. And everybody, the waves are coming in. And the, the big black belts were out a little further. Yep. And the wave carries this same guy in this fourth degree black belt. And as he comes by, you know, we're all very serious and fighting. And then the water and all this stuff, he says, he comes through and he says, mind if I play through? It's <laughs> <laughs> <That's> funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you have these moments, you know, where it's, where it's uh, winds up being completely authentic and the yeah. reality of human being comes through. It's really pretty funny. Yeah. Yeah. That's really good. I have a, uh... There's one quote I really like that no matter what happens to you in your day-to-day -day life, you always have the ability to bring humor, lightness, and grace to the situation. And it sounds like that's exactly what that black belt yeah, right. did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you would also like, uh, I'll tell you, humor is a big thing. If you go to the De Bono page, I've, mm. I've mentioned this twice today. I apologize to my listeners awesome. because they, they may have listened to the one just before you, but I was saying that you guys are very, very similar to the person that I was talking to before. So these thoughts are coming to my mind. But if you go to uh, De Bono, if you go to corebrainjournal.com forward slash D-E hyphen B-O-N-O, De Bono, he's got some things there, some videos that you would like because you're a coach. And uh, you, would get, you would get a kick out of it because he's talking about, and one of the things he talks about is the uh, humor, the creativity of humor and how, how essential it is. He's got a whole video on, on humor. He uh, was a Nobel Prize nominee. Wow. In economics, MD, PhD, on the faculty of Harvard, Oxford, and the University of London, and was raised in an island off the coast of Venice. Okay. Wow. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's, just, he's, an, he's a regular guy. It's unbelievable. I mean, he has a beautiful English accent, but he just talks to you like, hey, this is how the world works. And you're like, yep, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> just inherent knowledge. Yeah, he just Learned says knowledge. it so casually, you know, but he's, you can see that he's given it a tremendous amount of thought. You, you would like him. He's a good guy. That's really cool. I'll check it out. Well, listen, I'm looking at the time. I think we do have to wind up. I so much enjoyed talking to you. Let's make sure we punctuate where people can get in contact with you before we end, and then we'll, we'll also yeah, have... Let me, just, let me just say that I mentioned earlier, my partner, Jim Brown, who created Life and I, who are basically I'm bringing life mapping to the United States as this platform, we're really just looking for as many people as we can to create life maps and help them start this introspective like thought journey where you're looking at yourself. And these life maps are based on the future. So it's based on your ideal future, your ideal self, some challenges that you might have in your way now, and the tasks that you need to focus on for the next three to five years. So this is it's a tool to be used for the focus of somebody's life, like stretched out over mm -hmm. the long term. And there's a process of developing it that takes six weeks. And that's what I do with my one on one clients. And that has a separate cost, the one on one coaching. But making a map, creating a map, we wanted to make that available to as many people as we possibly can. So if on our website, it's called the Life Mapping Starter Package. And that is lifemapping.me is the website. Mm -hmm. And part of that starting package, like everything that's included, is a self-assessment workbook, which identifies 12 attributes of the future, of the key future for that person. It involves a custom-built life map that's built based on a template chosen by the individual client. And then all of that information is deposited uh, in our website. And my partner, Jim, creates a life map, puts the words in specific places on the map. And then again, all within that same life mapping starter package, well, life maps delivered, and there's a 30 minute phone call with a certified life mapping coach, of which there's five now in the country because, like I mentioned, we're training them. Fantastic, other fantastic. So, yeah, $100 gets a custom life map, a self assessment done by the client, and a 30 minute phone call with a real coach, just like me. 
That's fantastic. That's very, very cool. And it's, you know, when you think of the people, the thousands of dollars people who spent on therapy. I know. This is a hundred I mean, bucks. You know, we don't know who we are. We did all the therapy. We know what our mother is and we know who her father is, but we still didn't figure ourselves out. And, <laughs> right. you know, and apropos of this, folks, Tim also is giving us a PDF on life mapping, which is going to be a downloadable thing on the website. So when you come to the uh, show notes on Tim's interview here, it'll be right there on the show notes to be able to drop down that. And all those links, lifemapping.me, they'll all be on the show notes so you can get right to them. So good. I mean, I, we kind of winding up here, I think. It's yeah, a great think conversation. Great. Thank we you have so more much. to talk about, buddy. I've enjoyed talking to you. I'm yeah, we'll have to come back. We'll have to come back for part two. <laughs> yeah, we need part two. All we, all we have to do, you think about it. You let me know what it is and I'll be there, okay? We'll, we'll get right. it. No, no question. Right. Happy to have you come back. No question about it. Thank you, Dr. Chuck. I really appreciate what you're doing at Corbin and keep it, keep it going. Thank you, buddy. You too. I really appreciate it. Thanks for listening to Corbin Journal. We're working every day behind the scenes to bring you reports that connect research benches with those street trenches. Here we share the complexity of mind science because, as you know, details really do matter. One of the most pervasive misunderstood challenges is how commonplace medications like those written for ADHD are used so regularly without clear guidelines. If you think you'd like more specifics, take a minute to download my two-page PDF packed with video links and references on the absolute essentials of how to start ADHD medications. They're easily available at corebrainjournal.com forward slash start. Thanks for listening. Do connect and stay tuned. Together we can make a difference.